Right, good morning, everybody. I'm just going to get things sorted there. There we are. Okay, so welcome this morning Sean, to this. Sorry. Um, sorry? Sean, sorry, are you recording? Yes, yeah, recording now. Okay, sorry. Brilliant. Um, yes, good morning, everybody, and welcome to this introduction to network analysis. So today is going to be a a pretty light touch introduction to um, this concept of network analysis and how we can use it in health service research. Um, and then there's the two advanced sessions which will go much deeper into um, actually conducting a network analysis and how to make it really useful for health service research. But hopefully this will give you an idea of what it is and why it could potentially be useful for uh, the work that you do. So uh, what we're going to do, um, we're going to start off, uh, I'm, you've got quite a relaxing day today, there's quite minimal um, tasks and coding. So we're going to start off and we're going to discuss network analysis and its uses, then get a bit deeper into what a network is and look at the different components of a network. Then we'll have a little break. And after that, then we'll get into actually doing some hands on stuff. And one of the biggest tasks when actually conducting a network analysis is transferring the data, uh, transforming the data so that it is suitable to be represented as a network. And this is always quite a big task that needs to be undertaken. Um, but it helps you to understand how the network is being constructed and then we'll use our data that we transform and build a network graph uh, using the python package network x and that'll just be a very simple graph and then in the advanced sessions we'll go on to looking at all kinds of funky things like um, animated graphs and uh, um, how to uh, customize uh, the full look of a graph and different Python packages um, and some standalone ones for doing that. So kind of the learning objectives for today is well, to be able to understand what a network graph is and how it's constructed and really kind of understanding how that construction of the network is actually useful for health service research. And then to be able to transform the raw data so that you'd be able to conduct a network analysis on a data set. And that'll be transforming raw patient data, level data for a network analysis as th this is kind of the level that um, is useful to be working at with your data. And then we're going to look at how to create a simple network graph in Python. So. Uh, Quite a nice relaxed day, hopefully um, nothing too too stressful. Um, saving that for this afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> so network analysis and its uses. Um, so network graphs were uh, developed by um, Euler back in the 19... 30s, this is on my advanced set of slides, <laughs> so I'm trying to remember, but um, basically Euler was using um, network graphs to look at um, logistical problems. And since Euler's original work, it, they've been used most profusely to study the function of large and complex systems. We'll, we'll have a look at a couple of examples. And it's looking at the relationships and interactions between different elements of a system and trying to understand that in a way that is kind of a, that's graspable for humans, that trying to understand large and complex interactions is not something that we're particularly good at. Um, as humans, we prefer very simple, obvious patterns. And when you've got very, very large systems as healthcare systems tend to be um, with lots of different components, lots of different departments, lots of different teams within that, all working and operating slightly differently. Um, it can be very difficult to develop a, a picture of what that all those interactions and relationships look like. And 
in order to be able to kind of grasp this, we need a way to abstract the system itself, drawing a literal representation. Anything that's too literal would be, again, too complex and difficult to understand. But if we can represent them in an abstract way, in a mathematical way, then we've got um, something which is much more, uh, much simpler and more understandable to humans. So the kind of things that network analysis is used for currently, um, just kind of some, some classic uses of it, um, looking at things like uh, airline networks. So you'd have uh, airports within that and their routes that they're flying. And you'd look at the links between the airports and where they're flying to and from. Uh, banking, looking at account holders and where they're uh, undertaking their transactions. In social networks, this is kind of one of the largest uses of network analysis. Um, and this is used by Twitter and Facebook and Instagram and everybody. All those recommendations that you get for um, people that, you know, friends that you might want to link with, people you might want to follow. That's all the result of network analysis. And what they're using is looking at who you're closely associated with, but not associated with yet. Um, it's that kind of, um, if you remember the uh, big thing around six degrees of separation that we're only ever separated from any other person by six jumps um, through a network that we can, we can be related to um, or associated to to many, many, many millions, billions of people through only six jumps. And uh, that this is what social networks use and they use the close and how closely associated you are um, and some other stuff uh, around it as well. Uh, physician networks, so looking at doctors and patients, this is quite useful actually for um, looking at uh, GPs and how and GP usage is is one level that you can look at that. Um, the data that we'll be looking at is people and uh, patients and the services that they're using. So very similar to this kind of physician network idea. And then uh, it's used an awful lot in logistical planning, um, particularly around supply chains. So looking at the movement of goods around um, by some form of transport in this instance they've uh, given the example of trucks and uh, so being able to plan routes and to be able to plan um, how much of a, a particular goods are being moved between different warehouses different storage locations and then end points of sale locations um, and this is one of the classic techniques that is used for, for all this kind of planning, whether that be, as the examples give, airlines, road networks, um, yeah, supply chains. Um, it's, it's, it's one of those that sits behind and has been used for a long time uh, in a very simple way, or simple-ish ways, to look at these kind of very large logistical systems. So an example of uh, here of a network, um, graph of the um, flight routes in the United States. These are domestic flight routes. And you've got your airports are marked as what are the, uh, the nodes. And we'll come a bit more to this terminology in a minute. But our red dots are our large airports here. And the blue dots are our smaller airports. And then the green lines in between are all the routes that they're flying between the different airports. And so you'll hear today the terminology of nodes are um, the red dots and the blue dots. Here are our nodes. And then the green lines are our edges that are connecting between the airports. They're the routes. So the connections are the edges and the points that you're going between are the nodes. And yeah, this shows you've got here hundreds of airports 
and thousands of routes that are being flown because of the different combinations between. It'd be very difficult to represent this as a list. It would take you an awfully long time to read the list of all the airports and all the different routes that they're flying. So being able to see these kinds of visualizations really helped to rationalize what is a very large data set. Uh, this is an example of, um, this is a Twitter data set uh, showing the links between different um, Twitter users. And you see George Galloway in the middle here for some reason, um, wondering what was happening at the time. He was, yeah, it might have been that he was on, um, I'm a celebrity, get me out of here, I think, think he was on. And uh, it was probably trending at the time. And so what they, you know, Twitter use network analysis profusely to be able to look at who's getting the most tweets and retweets and um, likes uh, so that they can determine who's trending. Um, because that's not just done on numbers, it's also done on the proliferation of connections with other users. And so these are the kinds of graphs that they're using to see what's trending. These large dots will be the things that are, uh, our large nodes will be the things that are trending. And you start to see all the different connections between them. This graph has um, another uh, kind of dimension to it, which is the colouring of the nodes and uh, edges. And these are representing different clusters, different groups um, that are more closely linked. And so this is one of the kind of techniques that we can use to start kind of rationalising a graph to be able to see what's grouped together and how they group together and start to see these kind of populations and subpopulations that form these small clusters that are um, linked together and working very closely together um, in some kind of way. So when we're talking about network network based operational modeling for healthcare, um, So this is where we're trying to use network analysis and graphs to try and represent the operations of the healthcare system. And what we've got in this, this uh, graph here, we're trying to look at the graph itself as the service structure. So this whole thing will be the structure of how the different services, different teams are working together and how patients are moving between them. So the nodes themselves, these yellow dots, are the services that are being provided and the different teams that are providing those services. And the edges are their movement between the different services. And we can see that in this instance, they've got arrows on the end, meaning that there's a direction of movement between. So people moving from the Exeter Ramp team down to the Devon, uh, liaison, liaison and Diversion team, they're moving in this direction uh, from the Amp team to the di Liaison and Diversion team. And then they're moving off to different other different areas, whether the CRHT or the forensics. And we can start to be able to develop a story around the movement of patients. Um, and it's, it's, you start to see it take on a logical quality that in this instance, for those of you with a mental, uh, we've worked in mental health services, will recognize that uh, the allied mental health partners um, they uh, often deal with um, assessing people who might require being sectioned and they are they will often refer on to the liaison and diversion team and you will have a minority of people who require going on to the forensics team because they um, are of a higher level risk and those of a lower level risk will be might be referred on to the, um, the crisis resolution home treatment team. Um, 
So we can start to see the logic and movement between services for patients and the different requirements that they might have. And we can embed different information about how the services are operating within the graph itself. So we can look at the, the edge weight and you'll notice that the arrows themselves, the edges are of different thicknesses. And this is representing the weight. And this is the number of patients that are moving through the system, moving in a particular direction. So most uh, there's a large number moving from Delta Field to the Exeter um, Allied Mental Health Partners team. And this, this appears to be quite a key triangle between the AMP team, the liaison diversion team, and the CRH team. And so we can represent the number of um, kind of the, the usage, the activity that's occurring between two teams. And within the nodes themselves, you'll notice that the nodes are of different sizes um, and we can and also of different colors. And this is because we can embed information in the node attributes themselves. And these can be whether it's the number of people that are passing through the rate, we can attribute it to the length of stay. We can use a, uh, a graph measure of uh, something like centrality. So the connectedness of uh, one service to uh, the other services, and how central it is within the graph. And we can start to embed, embed lots of different information within these nodes, which makes them very useful um, for being able to uh, track and understand the operations because we can put operational measures within the nodes themselves. And when we get on to um, the animated types of graphs and looking at the actual performing analyses on them, you'll see that we can use this to bring in this information um, to inform the analysis itself and use the analysis to inform the visualization. So what we're trying to do is, 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 is this building a picture of um, what is uh, happening within the service structure and it's built out of the services themselves and the links that the patients form by their movements between different services. And then we can embed information about their movements and about the uh, operation of the services themselves. So the components of a network. So to kind of break this down a little bit further, the graph itself um, it's a, a network graph is a, a graph based representation of a system. And what that means is that it can be represented in Euclidean space or on a Cartesian coordinate system and that we can um, basically plot it on a pair of axes and describe where everything sits. Sorry, uh, please do excuse me one minute. There is a, there's a cheeky little Robin in the house. <laughs> I'll just be back. <laughs> <laughs> Got the door open and <laughs> just blown in. <laughs> um, where was I? Uh, so, um, yeah, so what we're doing is uh, we can represent the nodes and edges on axes and say what their relationship, we can mathematically describe their relationship with each other. And it's this pairwise relationship between entities that we're trying to uh, trying to describe. So I'll just pick that statement apart a little bit. So when we're talking about pairwise, we're talking about relationships between two nodes. So um, two of our services, and then we're talking because everything's about these pairwise as an edge goes from one node to another. So it's a pairwise relationship and the entities themselves are the services. And because we can encode, we can encode both, uh, we can encode uh, the quantitative properties of the system within the network structure. As I was just saying before, we can encode things like the length of stay, the waiting lists, um, 
the uh, centrality of a node within the network, um, its uh, number of nearest neighbors, its uh, number of connections with the rest of the network. Um, we can encode uh, the weights, the activity along the edges, but we can also say, um, put things like uh, delay and transfer um, in an edge um, and say how long it takes for somebody to move from one service to another. And then start embedding all sorts of information. The graph itself is just a tool to help us work with the data. So when we look at network graphs in their most simple form, um, there's a few different kind of attributes that, that kind of the, the nodes and the edges themselves hold. So the nodes are our dots here, and they're also called vertices. Um, so if you see that terminology when you're reading around or in any of the literature, um, or in, in I, I might accidentally slip and call them a vertex or a node. Um, I try to call stick to one and just call them nodes. Nodes are, uh, seem to be a much more intuitive name for them, but mathematically they're known as vertices. And these are the dots. And then the edges, the link between one node and another. And this is where we get this pairwise relationship that in this instance, V1 is related to V2 by a particular edge. And so there are lots of different types of graphs that we can have. And again, we'll talk about this much more in the advanced session. Um, but at its most simple level, when it doesn't matter about order, so the link can be is between V1 and V2, but it can also be described as V uh, link between V2 and V1. It doesn't matter about order. That's just a simple, that, that's a graph. When order does matter, we have a digraph. So it's a directed graph. And that means that when we describe an edge, as in the earlier example, where we had arrows, which were indicating a direction, that the order V1, V2, to describe the edge, matters. That in the description V2 to V1 would be different to V1 to V2. Um, and so that helps, that's particularly useful for health service research because people tend to move, we need to know what direction they're moving in. If we're just interested in um, looking at the links between services, then we might use an unordered graph, but we'd probably use a directed graph when we're interested in looking at how patients are moving between different services. Um, and then we get our edge weight, which we discussed, and our different node attributes that can be embedded within the nodes. There are a few different little bits of terminology. Um, we get things that are called parallel edges, and this is depicted between V5 and V4 here, that we can see that there is a link from V4 to V5 and from V5 to V4. This, these are parallel edges because they're um, describing movement between the two nodes in the um, opposite directions, but between the same two nodes. Then we get loops or self loops. And this is seen at V5 here. So people can, they might enter uh, a particular service and complete their treatment, but then need to come back in. Um, so they're then back into the same service again. So they come back around. And these self, self loops are an important concept in graph theory um, because we need to be able to describe that um, movement back around into the same node. Then we get uh, adjacent edges and adjacent edges are basically edges that are next to each other. So the edge, edges that are described between V1 and V2 
and V2 and V5 are adjacent. They are, they stem from a common node and are essentially next to each other. And adjacent nodes are, uh, we can see that V2 and V5 are linked by an edge and therefore that makes them next to each other. Um, so they're, they're adjacent nodes. The interesting thing with network analysis and graph theory is that the terminology is actually relatively simple um, because it's a heavily maths based approach. Um, it has a lot of they they have to give everything a name um, <laughs> basically. Um, so there's lots of this um, quite simple terminology just just to grasp to be able to um, understand some of the literature if you're reading around network analysis and graph theory. So when we actually come to build network graphs, um, the data that we require is relatively simple. Um, we don't need enormous amounts, but there's it's very specific information that we need and in a very specific format. So when you're building network graphs, you will, um, ooh, the Robin's back, um, you will uh, get uh, the two, two different particular lists that will need to go in. One is an, your node list and the other is your edge list. And node lists are commonly comprised of an ID. So you need a unique identifier for every node. And this is normally numerical. Then you will have a label, which will be your, um, your description in words. And then you can add as many attributes as you like. But the only two pieces of information that we must have are the ID and a label. And then the edge list itself. So this is what more actually describes the structure of the network itself. And there's two pieces of new terminology here. The first is source and second target. And what these are describing are the start and the end of an edge. So just to go back here. So if we're describing and this edge between V1 and V2. And in an undirected graph, it doesn't matter which way around we describe it, but we need to describe it one way around. Um, so V1 can be our source node and V2, our target node. And so you're always describing source and targets when creating an edge list and Robin's gone out and we need that in an undirected graph you will it you will just simply have source and targets and there will be a link between your nodes when you're doing a directed graph you need to describe each direction so if there was links um, for example we'd describe V4 as a source and V5 as a target here, but then we'd also describe V5 as a source and V4 as a target. So you need both in your list in order to be in when you're creating the directed graph. For a self loop, the source and the target will be the same. They will both be V5. So in the edge list, this is what really creates our source and target. Um, yeah, this is what creates our network structure. And then we can attach our attributes to the edges as well. So I'm seeing that I am actually running a bit ahead of time. Um, so we're just going to hold on a bit. And if you don't mind, we'll just give it another uh, 25, 20, 
maybe 20 minutes, we'll just do a little bit more and then we'll have a little break. Um, so what I'm going to talk about now is data transformation and how we transform patient level data into a um, suitable format for creating a network and to be able to describe our system structure and how it's operated. So the data transformation process, you want to be starting with raw data, patient level. And this data, as you'll see, um, in fact, actually, let me bring up a get the time. I'll bring up the example of the data that we're going to use for our first task. So when we look at this kind of, this is um, a patient level mental health data set that I've used, uh, uh, was used for a project and I've developed an anonymized set for training. And what we've got here is a client ID. Um, so a unique identifier for uh, each patient the date that they're referred to a service and the date that they're discharged from a service. This, uh, we've got the referral source in this instance, um, although we don't necessarily have to use that. Um, we've got the team that they're actually accessing and then some other information about, um, about the patient. Um, so, and the services that they're accessing. So, uh, general specialty, the um, condition that they have, uh, the cluster, the care cluster that they're in, um, and some information about the services. So the setting uh, it's community or inpatient services and the uh, geographic locality as well. So we can use what is actually here a relatively simple data set um, in, to, in order to be able to create a picture of how the services are operating. So when we're doing the data transformation, what we're aiming to do is we, we've got to first of all clean up our data, make sure that uh, we get everything's consistent, we get rid of uh, negative dates and um, any um, particularly erroneous white space in categories that uh, can make it that you end up with multiple instances of, of a team. And that's definitely what you don't want. Um, uh, so we've got to make sure we thoroughly clean our data. Um, but the, important thing that we've got to do is it's getting the order of the data correct in order to be able to develop our network graph. So what we're doing is we're going to order our data by patient first of all, and then by the um, order in which they have been referred to services so that we can see the order in which they're using services one after, well, either at the same time or one after another, but then accessing one service first, then they're accessing another and then another and then another. So by ordering our data, we can, we can infer that order that they're accessing services, even though they might be accessing multiple services at the same time. So once we've ordered our data, we can then create something called an adjacency matrix. And we'll discuss a little bit more about this shortly. But this is the kind of the, uh, the core of any description of a network it can be described using an, ad an adjacency matrix. Um, and yeah, yeah, I'll discuss that more in a bit, minute. It's easier to show you with an example. And we'll be using, so we're using unique instances of services as our nodes. And here, this is a kind of where a bit of the 
the art in developing the model comes in, where it all depends on the resolution of your data. So whether you have specific teams or a specific service or geographic localities, depending on what the resolution is of your data, at what level you want to be looking at it and how you want to subset or amalgamate different aspects of your data um, to create higher or lower level nodes. So um, at the lowest level, you'd have an individual team or maybe an individual person. At the highest level, you would probably have something like geography um, or the trust itself. <laughs> um, so depending on the scope of your data and the level that you're wanting to look at it, you need to start subsetting and amalgamating different elements of it. And what we do is we then iterate over the interaction matrix, um, our uh, adjacency matrix to create our edge list and to look at what our source and target nodes are and the weight of the edge between those source and target nodes. So these are just um, in terms of data cleaning, just some things which uh, you want to consider. Um, it becomes very obvious very quickly when you start having multiple nodes which um, say the same thing in, in your graph. Um, and this is normally due to things like erroneous white space, um, spelling mistakes, capitalization inconsistencies within the data. Um, it's really important that, uh, that you do a really good job cleaning, cleaning the data, um, first of all. So an adjacency matrix. So what we have here is a two-dimensional array and our rows represent our um, source, our source node. So each one of these will represent an individual service or team. And the columns represent the target. And again, zero and zero here, or one and one on the rows and columns will represent the same service. And our adjacency, so the, when we're building the adjacency matrix, we're basically going through our data and looking at the first service used by a patient and then what the next service is that they used. And so the first service becomes our source and our second service that they're using becomes the target. And we can go through the data in this way, going down service by service, then going from the second and seeing what the third one is. And then we mark this down in our adjacency matrix and count up the number of move, movements that patients are making between different source and target services. Um, and so you can see here that some are marked with one, others have higher numbers. We've got nine, there's a movement of nine between five, service five and service five. So those self loops, so people coming back in to the same service over and over again, uh, between five and six, movement to two. And so we start, th th this is kind of the, the data underpinning the shape of the network graph itself. And from this, from the adjacency matrix, then we then build up our node list. So we get our, we give each node an, um, an ID. And then we give it a label so that we know what it actually is. And then we can add different attributes to it. So things like mean length of stay, the median length of stay, and the setting. So we can have um, continuous and discrete attributes. Um, categories work as well as um, continuous numerical attributes. Then in our edge list, we are 
we, we know that we need our source and our target nodes. And these are, these use the numbers, the ID of the nodes themselves. So that's how you link the node to the node list to the edge list is via the ID. So it's absolutely essential that each node has a unique ID because that's what your source and target are describing. And then we have an ID for each edge, the unique ID and the weight of each edge. I've also got um, type in here. So whether it's a directed or undirected edge, and this is something that is required by a program called Gephi, which we will have a look at, which is a standalone um, graph visualization software, piece of graph, graph visualization software, which is very powerful. Um, one of the best ones for creating very nice graph visualizations, but it's a bit fiddly to work with, but we will look at it because it creates very nice um, graph visualizations. And again, we can have both continuous and discrete attributes um, for our edges. Um, so we've got weight here. We could have um, something like the uh, rate of movement um, between nodes embedded in here as well. Um, so all kinds of, you know, the, uh, I don't, things like the, uh, the wait time, the delay of transfer between one service and the next, um, all sorts of different, anything you can think of, you can start embedding within the graph. Um, if it's operation, it's, it operationally describes what's happening in the services, you can embed it in the graph and start asking questions about it. So, I'm going to stop here for a minute, and when we come back, we're going to look at an example of uh, how we transfer the data set, which I briefly showed you earlier. And we're going to look at how we transform that data set in Python into the adjacency matrix, the node list, and the edge list. And then we're going to uh, use that to create a network graph afterwards. So um, I think it's worth having an opportunity to make a cup of tea and we will come back at, if we have, might as well have 20 minutes as we're doing very well. <laughs> um, I've kept today quite light. So, um, so if we come back at 20 to 11, so 11 at 10.40, come back at 10.40, just stay logged in, just uh, stay on um, mute and with the cameras off and yeah, save having to log back out and come back in. And we'll uh, carry on in 20 minutes. Sean, is it worth just seeing if anybody's got any uh, sort of questions just as we seem to be good for time? <laughs> oh yes, yes, that's a very good point. Thanks, Dan. <laughs> So um, it's Heather here. I had an idea um, a little while ago, and I wasn't quite sure how to enact it. I'm, I belong to AFA, um, and one of the things I wanted to do was almost track who AFA members are interacting with and, and see who are the real influencers, you know, around the country. You know, yeah. so it was almost like I was going to send out a survey and saying, you know, name the, the top three people that you go to if you've got a question type thing. And... and so like build it back in. Is that the kind of thing that you're doing in a network analysis? Absolutely. Absolutely. You're looking at the relationship between individuals and their influence. So, um, you know, and you, you do some kind of proxy measure uh, for influence. So you might look at it in terms of the, uh, the number of messages that they've sent or, um, well, you, you can do it in, it depends on what data you can, you can get, but yeah, you'd use, use some kind of measure of influence. Um, even if that is simply the number of people that they're connecting with. Um, so that will be 
and we'll look at this in the advanced sessions when we're looking at graph metrics but so you can have multiple you'll have multiple edges connecting with a single node and that's called the degree and if they've got a high out degree so they're connecting with other people then you might infer that they're heavily influential and yeah the graph will quite easily show that if you're looking at yeah collecting your data from those people that they're communicating with does that help it does i, I just hadn't um i think i knew that i thought we wanted to do it for AFA, but i wasn't quite sure how to approach it but this might um yeah start us thinking yeah. about ways and means really yeah this is this is the perfect way to to look at um that kind of uh, influencing behaviors so yeah that's commonly used in social network analysis which is a slightly different area to what we're talking about here with operational but social networks all uses the same mathematics and the same principles it's just the that you use in person data um about uh person to person data rather than person to service data that we use it here and the only problem is this getting hold of the data without having to generate it through service <laughs> Mm. Yes, yeah. Um, one thing that I don't, with NHSR, you know, I was just thinking, uh, we have a, there's the NHSR Slack channel. Uh, so I don't know if AFA has a Slack channel or something like that, but you can use um, whoever's the most, extract the data from that and use whoever's the most um, uh, communicating and sending the most messages to people. And you can look at the message communication between different individuals if you can get the analytics out back, get the data out on that. So you're mentioning Slack, so then presumably you can um, get, you, yourselves can get data out of Slack? For the uh, do you know what, channel? I haven't tried. I'd, I'd <laughs> have thought that um, actually maybe with a paid for account, you probably can. Yeah, just to, just to reassure you, I, I'm not harvesting all your, all your data. <laughs> <laughs> Not, no, I'm going to give you a bad rap I down. Didn't think of it, uh, but I, <laughs> I wasn't. I wasn't thinking about that. I was just thinking that if you knew that you could get data out, and you could probably tell us how to do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah um, no, I'm not sure. I, I don't. I don't know of a way. I, Sean might be right that it might be that it's uh, um, you know paid for feature in terms of um, the mm. analytics behind that. Um, I haven't been. In fact, I think it is because I'm pretty sure that when I set up the the new HSMA channel, they put me on the uh, the premium thing as a trial, um, which I just largely ignored, but I'm pretty sure that one of the things was about analytics. So I yeah. think if you pay, and Slack is expensive if you're paying for it, very expensive. Um, so I think if you pay for it, then yes, you can get that data, I believe. But to, to be honest, most um, social network analysis is actually based on survey data a lot of the time. Anyway, it's, um, it's, it's only, yeah, it's only with uh, web-based or um things that they actually are able to collect data you know it's twitter facebook etc um but if you're not operating on that level yeah it's normally survey data that you'd use thank you can i ask a question please? Yeah. oh sorry adam i can't can't hear you oh um yeah can you hear me now uh yeah just about um, the data cleansing bit of the procedure, is there any easy way to do that? Or is it just simply going through all that data, making sure there are no extra spaces and extra taxes? Um, so I'll show you some examples of that. Uh, and when we do the trans data transformation um, task after the break, um, yeah, we will see. Uh, yeah, I will show you some easy ways to to do things. Um, right, you know, thank checking, you. checking dates and but some of it is manual. <laughs> um, but as you get used to what the issues in your data are, you can write functions to automate the uh, cleaning process. There are lots. Just to chip in as well, there are lots of um, 
uh, built-in functions into Python libraries that you can use, to, uh, which uh, I'm sure Sean will show you some of these, um, uh, to uh, clean up text data, for example. So in, in the natural language processing module, when we come on to that, um, cleaning your data is also really important for that. Um, and that could be things like, you know, removing capital letters and um, uh, getting rid of um, identifying words that are supposed to be the same, but they've just been spelt differently or something like that. And there's lots of methods that, that are actually built in to, to allow you to do that. So um, yeah, don't worry, there's, lot, there's lots of um, uh, things that allow you to automate this process so that uh, uh, the, the, the amount of stuff you have to do manually is, is minimized. Hey, thank you very much. Super. Anything else at the moment? They've probably all gone on the break. <laughs> okay. Right. Well, um, yeah. Let's let's come back at um, at twenty two. Uh, we've still got fifteen minutes. That will uh, should be plenty of time to make a cup of tea and uh, uh, have a bit of a break. And we'll get on with uh, with our data transformation task. Thank you very much, everybody. Thanks, Sean. Um, you can, by the way, you can put. Uh, you're probably aware you can pause the recording. All right. So. Let's start, start recording and start sharing my screen. Okay. So, I hope everybody had a nice break and we're going to get on with our data transformation task. So, this is really to help familiarize you with what the data looks like because Network graphs to look at them, yeah, that's that's fine. But actually, what we're trying to learn here is how to create them, and it's all about the underlying data structure, um, because that's that's what we actually perform analyses on and um, work with. The visualizations are just the pretty bit. Um, so, what we're going to be working with is uh, so on Slack and uh, on GitHub, I've sent through in the materials, there's the data transformation.py file. So I'd like you to open that up in Spider. And this code is an example of how to transform patient episode data ready for uh, network analysis and visualization. So This example is is quite a good. I'd like to say it's quite a good one because it works with um, all of the different. Uh, it provide, produces a data set that works with um, the different Python libraries for network analysis and also with Gephi. So the output files can be read in um, into multiple different um, different packages. So. When you um, open up Spider and open up the data transformation.py file, don't forget to set your working directory because it's going to be trying to locate the data file that we're going to be using, which you've got to make sure is in the folder data. Um, that's the PD data uh, hsma2020.csv. And yeah, that should be in the data file should be folder should be in the same location as the data transformation.py file. So set your working directory to wherever you've got the data transformation.py file. And what I'd like you to do, um, you know, this is this is not a tough task, but it's it's more it's an exploratory task to get you looking and investigating the data. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to split you into breakout rooms. Hopefully this will work. Um, and I'd just like you to just sit down and just discuss and run the code line by line and determine what's happening within the code. Use print commands and or the variable explorer uh, to look and examine the data transformations that are happening. Um, just going to bring over the data transformation.py file. 
So um, it's using pandas and numpy only here. Uh, so we haven't got any extra packages coming in. And you're going to be, yep, yeah, so this is the read in, uh, data read in uh, line. And so this is why you need to make sure that the data is in the right place. And yeah, it's just a case of going through. I put some comments in to, so that you can see the different stages, but it's actually looking at the data transformations themselves and particularly around the adjacency matrix how that's being created and the edge list and the node list. The files themselves, uh, there's outputs. So um, the adjacency matrix will be output as a CSV, which you can look at separately uh, along with the edge list and the node list. So what I'm going to do is just pop you into I'm going to assign automatically. We're going to mix this up a little bit just for just for fun. So you'll be put into random breakout rooms with uh, five participants per room, and just have a go, um, and just uh, go through. And if you have any issues, um, I'll drop into try and drop into each of the rooms. Um, but let us know in Slack if you're having any issues. Sean, I was just wondering what one appropriate punishment is for you going over the 80 character limit vertical line. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I think we should, we should have you shot. <laughs> uh, yes, yeah, well, that's, uh, <laughs> I'll, um, I'll, I'll whip myself later. That's, uh, yes. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so we just have kind of 15 minutes um, looking at, at this 15, 20 minutes just to go through, have a good discussion about it. Okay, if you haven't managed to join a breakout room yet, there should be a button for you to click to join and that will take you into, into your breakout room. Hi there, Vic. Uh, just say I'm going to assign you to a breakout room. Um, I'm sure we catch up on the task. It's uh, we're just going through the data transformation.py file um, and exploring the data transformations that are needed for a network. So uh, you should have an invitation to join a breakout room now. Yeah, thanks.
Okay, so yeah, hopefully that was um, at least a useful exercise to remind yourselves uh, this week of a bit of Python and to, to see data wrangling in action. Now we're going to look at how we can use this data to build a network graph. So this we're going to do as a bit of a code along task. Um, so I haven't given you any code for this. It does rely on you having run the, uh, I'm pretty sure I didn't put, um, yeah, it, it relies on you actually having run that first task to be able to create the data. Um, and what we're going to do, the process that we go through when building a network graph using network X is that we read in our data. So in this instance, it will be our node list and our edge list. We then create a graph object. So this is the, uh, the network X graph object, NX graph that is responsible for handling our network. And then we've got to format our node and edge data into the correct um, final format for it to be read into the graph object. So this is where we create tuples of list and dictionary objects. And then we add the nodes and edges to the graph. And then after that, we plot the graph itself and draw it. So don't worry, I'm, I'm not going to ask you just to go away and try and do this. Um, we're going to go through this step by step. So open a, uh, a new um, a new script in Spider, and you're going to type the code in and run it as we go. You will need to move your node list and edge list CSVs that you created in the, in the last task into the data file um, that, we, that we've been using in your working directory. So if everybody can do that, first of all, if you haven't run that um, data transformation code, please run it now and to create the CSVs. And Sean, let me know if anybody has any issues. Sorry, Sean, I, I think it already has done that because uh, mine is already stored in the data subfolder. Ah, is it in there already? Did I, yeah. um, did I have it put out? I think you, you, you wrote them out, Sean. You just you explicitly wrote them out to a data subfolder path. Did I? Excellent. Yeah. Excellent. I'm ahead of myself there. Then that's um, I. Uh, <laughs> I thought it thought ahead and uh, and did that. Excellent. So they should be in the right place if you've run that code. Okay. So new script, and we're going to start by importing network X as NX remembering our kind of conventions for short, shortening these words, uh, these package names. Uh, NX is what's used for network X. So we're going to start the first two lines, so import network X as NX, then import pandas as PD. Then we're going to read to the nodes, to a nodes variable, we're going to assign our uh, node list data frame and to edges variable, assign our edge list data frame. If I go too quickly, shout at me, just shout. Oh, can you go back? Um, otherwise, I will just give a pause and then move on. So then our next line is that we're going to assign 
to the variable g our graph object. So this is basically initializing an empty graph. And that's just g equals nx.graph with a capital G. Is that convention, Sean, for the um, to have a capitalized variable name for your graph? Yeah, yeah, they tend to do that for the graph objects. That's okay. what, well, in terms of convention, it's what they use in the documentation. Yeah. Um, so just kind of sticking to, to that. But yeah, you can call it my graph, anything like that. Yeah, yeah, no, just, just interesting because obviously it's, um, I've seen a few other things, there's some things in NLP where it's convention to do, um, have a variable name that's capitalized, which obviously you wouldn't normally do. Right, uh, okay. Yeah, I think they tend to do it when you've got very specific custom objects. Um, at least that's what I've seen with uh, with the network analysis packages. Right, yeah, yeah. Okay, so we've got our graph. Now, what we need to do is to create the node inputs. And these are tuples. And if you remember from um, Dan's introduction to Python, tuples are immutable objects. That means once they're created, they can't be changed. Um, and it just means that they're held stable. Um, they're very stable objects for us to work with. Um, and the way that Network X likes to take lists of nodes is as tuples. Um, and so we create a tuple of the node ID and a dictionary of attributes. So for every node, every node has a dictionary attached to it. So what we're gonna do in our first line is we're creating an ID list, which is our, our node IDs. And so from nodes, we take the column ID and we convert it to a list. That's our first line here. Then what we need to do is, so our attributes in this instance are just gonna be our labels. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna create a new data frame simply with, a, uh, with the column label. So our, our node labels. So labels equals PD dot data frame, open brackets, nodes, square brackets to say this is the column that we want to extract and we're extracting the column label. And that's given in um, in single, single or double quotes, it doesn't matter. And then what we're going to do is we're going to convert the label to dictionaries. And we're going to create a di separate dictionary for every label. So we're creating our variable of uh, label dicks. So um, that's a uh, it's it's a dictionary of dictionaries. And so we're using from labels. We're using the function to dict and the orientation is by records. So this means that it's creating a separate dictionary for every record. And then finally, we can create the tuple. So this is, I've just called it variable node tuples. And here we're using, um, uh, list comprehension. So this is where we can do a for loop in a single line. And we're creating a tuple of R. So this is basically for, for R, which is our, the length of our list. So our list, our ID list 
and our dictionary of dictionaries are both of the same length. So it's using the length to know how many times to go through. And what it's doing, we use the zip command here to sorry, are, zip. I'm sorry, are we supposed to be typing this out while you do it or just watching? Uh, typing it out. Well, um, yeah, yeah. You're supposed to okay. start a new script and to be typing. Well, I, I am, but I'm obviously yeah. not typing as quickly as everybody else. Um, so the Where one are you just. Up to? Well, I, is the page just before this the g.nx.graph? Yes. Yes. Okay. So if I've got that, could you mind just going over what the other bits mean? Because I've sort of lost what they mean as I've been typing after this page, the next page. This one. Okay, Thanks. so I'll just finish my explanation and yeah. I'll go back okay. over it. Okay. Yep. So what we're doing with, when we're creating the tuple is we're looping through our ID list and our labeled dictionaries and we're zipping them together into a tuple. So we're taking the ID element from the list and the dictionary and we're putting them together into a tuple and outputting that. So just to go back over that, we are creating a list using the to list function of the IDs in the nodes data frame. We're then extracting the from the nodes label column creating a new data frame simply with just the labels column, and that's called labels. We're then converting the labels data frame and converting each row to a dictionary object and so that we have a dictionary of dictionaries. And this is called label dicks, which we've got to be careful how I say that. That's, um, and this is um, where we're just converting each individual one to a dictionary. If we were having, if we were using more attributes, we'd have more than just the label in each dictionary for each node. Um, but in this instance, we've just got the one attribute, which is the label. And then we're creating a tuple, which is an immutable object. And that means that it's cut once it's created, can't be changed. Uh, so it's a nice stable object for us to use. And that we're creating no tuples from by zipping together the ID of the node and the dictionary of its attributes. And we're doing that for all of the uh, each node in turn. And we're using list comprehension here, which is this in square brackets to run a for loop in a single line. These um, li using list comprehension and zip is uh, something which is extremely useful in Python um, and makes your code very concise. Um, so, and I think there'll be, there'll be more examples of this um, as, as we go through the course. Yeah, there's some in um, the natural language processing, Sean. It's very similar to the way you have to do on this. Yeah, yeah, no, it's a really good technique to be able to learn. Okay. So how would you add the, another attribute in on the labels dicks then? So what we do with that is where we're just taking the um, column label yes. into our labels variable here in the data frame, mm. we'd have other rows, uh, sorry, other columns that we might have length of stay or um, uh, length of stay, waiting time for the nodes. Um, so and we'd have additional columns and then we'd just, we'd go through exactly the same process. It's just our data frame would be larger. Okay, so it would just be comma nodes, and then again, and a different thing, length of stay. So you'd put the nodes again and keep repeating that piece there inside those brackets. 
Yes, but you'd yes. have to put you'd have to put that in square brackets, I believe. Okay. Um, in order to be able to, because you create a list okay. of the columns. Okay. As your argument input argument. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Right. So now we've got our node objects. What we now need to create are our edge objects. Um, so the edge inputs are tuples again. And here we're creating, we need the source ID, the target ID. So remember, these are a start and end points of our edges, which are our, given by our node IDs. And again, a dictionary of attributes. So our edge tuples are source, target, and then dictionary of attributes in that order. So we're using exactly the same process again. Our source list is going to be getting the source column from the edges data frame and converting it to a list. Our target list is taking the target column from the edges data frame and converting it to a list as well. We then get the weights and because those are our attribute that we want to attach to our edge and we create a new data frame just with the weight edges weight column. And then we convert the weights to a dictionary of dictionaries using the to dict function and orientating by records. Again, then we convert into a tuple. So our edge tuples, we're using the same list comprehension, tuple R for R in, which is our loop syntax saying, do this for all the records. And we're zipping together the source list, which is our list of source nodes, our target list, which is our list of target nodes, and the weight dictionary, the dictionary that contains the weights for each, uh, for each edge. So, one of the things, one of the things that really confused me with tuples is I always thought they had to be made of a certain number of objects or, you know, they could only take two, three, four things. Tuples are, uh, can take as many different arguments as you want to put into them, but it's simply that immutability of them. I just find a, a funny name. That's uh, it's one that I, it took me a while to get my head around. Good way to think about uh, think about them, Sean. Actually, is, I, I found is to imagine them uh, sort of you know whatever your um, arrays are, your lists of things that they're kind of frozen. Then you, you're freezing them in time, uh, so they, like I say, it's, it, it's that immutability, isn't it, that, that that makes them unique? Yeah, yeah, great, great explanation there, Dan. That's uh, that's really helpful. Yeah, and, and it's funny because you think, oh, okay, is, is, is that a special thing? And it is, yeah, it is a special thing to freeze something like that. Um, but yes, just a very strange name. I'm sure there's a reason, there's always a reason for these names. But, uh, and, and I'll probably get told off for calling them tuples, they're also called tuples. Um, Depends who you're speaking to. <laughs> I like it when uh, when Tom says tuple <laughs> with his northern accent. <laughs> tuple. <laughs> okay, and moving on. So now, now we've done the hard bit. Um, we created all of our, our node tuples and our edge tuples. So now what we're going to do is we're going to add them to our graph objects that we created earlier. So we do that simply with the syntax G, which is our graph object, then using the dot operator and the function add nodes from, and we add our node tuples object to that. 
and the same for the edges, our graph object G dot add edges from and the edge tuples object gets added there. So this is a way you can add, if you look at network the network X um, uh, documentation, there's a few different ways that you can add nodes and edges to a graph. You can add them individually, um, or you can add them from an adjacency matrix. But this, I find a little bit more of a, um, a generalized approach. Um, all the different packages take their nodes and edges um, from node and edge lists. Um, and you can work with the, uh, the format of the node and edge lists with all the different um, uh, Python packages for uh, undertaking network analysis. So it's just a little bit more of a generic way in. So now, now that we've got, we've added our nodes and edges to our graph, um, but we haven't told it how we want it to visualize the graph. And one thing is, <laughs> One of the hardest things about graph visualization is working out how to place all of these many nodes and edges in relation to one another. And this is very much something of an art. Um, and in the advanced sessions, you'll see, we'll, we'll talk a lot more in depth about um, graph layouts and just how, <laughs> how difficult it is um, especially with large numbers of uh, nodes and edges. But um, with network X, we need to determine a position, a set of coordinates for our nodes and determine, and this essentially gives us edge start and end points. Um, network X and the other network analysis packages in Python come with a set of um, algorithms for determining what the coordinates of the nodes should be or could be, <laughs> just basically giving suggestions. And some of these algorithms are better than others, um, depending on the number of connections that you have between the nodes and the number of nodes and edges that you have within a graph. In this instance, we're going to have a play with the Kamada Kawai layout. Um, so what we're going to do is assign to the variable pos uh, nx dot Kamada Kawai layout. And the input argument to that function is our graph object. So what it will do is it will go through and assign each node a um, position in on a Cartesian coordinate system, so on a on a x y graph, and assign where each node should go, and that's what it's saving into the pos variable. And finally, we can draw that. We've now got everything that we need. We've got our graph variable um, graph object, which has our nodes and edges in it, and we've determined our position. Um, for our nodes and hence our uh, edge start and end points. So we're going to create our plot um, by using the function nx.draw. And the arguments that we pass into that are our graph object, first of all, g. Then we need to define the position. So the, um, the argument pos we assign the variable that we created, pos. And then just to a little bit of um, aesthetics, uh, we are going to change the node size to 100. Say with labels is true. And change the font size of those labels to 10. 
And when you run all of that, you should hopefully, fingers crossed, get a network graph. So I am going to bring my copy across. And here's one I prepared earlier. So let me just make sure that I've got my working directory set. That's always a good idea. So when we run this, import network X and pandas. Ooh, no, I haven't put them in there. Let's see. Everyone else got their data, but I put it in the wrong place. So we can read in our edge list and our node list. Create a graph object, G. And then to create the node tuples, can see, create our ID list, which is just um, a list of integers. We then get our labels, which is just a data frame of our labels. Then we create the label dictionaries, which are, is a dictionary, uh, sorry, no, it's a list of dictionaries. So uh, each one of these is a separate individual dictionary using the key label and the value of the label itself. We then get our node tuples, which are our um, ID here and then the dictionary as well. And then we do the same for our edge tuples. And in this instance, we can see we get our two, we get our source and our target um, IDs, and then the dictionary for the weight. Then we add our nodes and edges to our graph object create the position, which is a NumPy array of coordinates for each node within a Cartesian coordinate system. And then we create the plot. And that should render in your plot window. There we are. And that is your first network graph. Does anybody have any questions on any of that at all? So if, if we'd added in the, another attribute of length of stay, like, you know, the median, would we be able to make the size of them larger based on that attribute? Yes, yeah, absolutely. Yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah, and we'll see examples of that um, in the advanced session. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll go through all of that in much more detail. Okay. And how to create very, very nice looking 
um, that will be in the second session, in fact. Um, okay. Let me just go back to the presentation. Yes. So in the optional sessions, we'll yeah. be looking at different graph types. We'll be looking okay. at graph metrics. So how we can describe the structure of the graph and how we interpret graph metrics in relation to uh, health service operation. We'll be looking at how graph visualizations work because the kind of the graph algorithms for determining the layouts and how you do custom okay. layouts are quite complex. And then we'll also be looking at interactive graphs with Plotly and Holoviews. So the, the different the, the distance between the different nodes on on the plot we've just produced. Um, what is that then? The distance between the different nodes. So um, in the positioning um, in the positioning uh, uh, algorithm that we used um, I am not sure sometimes um, things like uh, centrality um, is used to determine which how things are clustered how different nodes are clustered together because some of them are really touching, aren't they? Yes. And others, yeah. others are very far apart. Yeah, it all depends. I mean, touching, but they've got no root between them. Yeah, I'm just, this is, this is all uh, what we cover in the later sessions. I am just trying to think. No, I can't remember. Because this, uh, I can't remember what the Kamada Kawai um, layout is using um, okay. to determine its di uh, distances. But yeah, those okay. those distances and the positions will be determined by different features of the graph itself. Okay. So, Sean, is it all down to the layout then, in terms of how, like the one that you showed us earlier with the Twitter and how it is all color coded and things like that? Is that all dependent on the layout that you choose? Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, so what they're likely doing there is, and again, we'll see um, what you do is calculate whether it's uh, clustering or modularity of the nodes, how they link with other nodes. And then you assign clusters to them and you can use that to inform the layout so it groups clusters of nodes together more closely. Cool. Could I ask about um, so the example here with uh, mental health services? What sort of question was that trying to answer, and how did, how did that work? Just to understand how it could be transferred to other. other right. Okay. So yeah. Um, so. <laughs> The ways that I've been using network analysis with mental health data has been to one, map um, the interactions between different services is incredibly useful on its own <laughs> um, to know which services are interacting with which other services, um, how patients, the direction that patients are moving between services. Um, you can start to look at which are the most highly connected services, those that are facilitating the, um, the transfers of care for patients, um, where you're seeing people coming back into services, where you've got lots of uh, cyclical behaviour is one thing that we look for, um, so that trying to determine if people are not receiving the uh, most appropriate service because they're simply coming back in and using the same service at a uh, high rate um, of uh, repetition. And that's, that's an issue because it, mean, it indicates that there's not an appropriate service for somebody. Um, 
and looking at the, uh, the length of stay and the accrual of waiting lists across a system and where there might be knock-on effects that people might spend a short amount of time with one service, then they're referred on to another service which doesn't have sufficient capacity to take the patients that are being referred on to them, um, potentially because their treatment time is much longer um, or they just have a huge backlog with insufficient capacity. Um, and starting to be able to identify these kinds of um, operational issues within, um, within the data. If that makes sense. Yes, thank you. I'm also uh, exploring at the moment and trying to see if I can get a master's project together around it on um, a uh, looking at the application of machine learning for networks and trying to predict future system state, um, which is slightly involved. <laughs> um, but there are um, specific uh, graph based uh, graph neural networks which use graph data because the data is more complex than the uh, kind of data that you traditionally get even for image analysis. Um, but graph approaches can be very useful for image, an image analysis as well as understanding uh, different, um, the kind of more complex and uh, deeper patterns that occur over time within networks, um, large systems themselves, which we can't analyze using classical methods. Okay, so just to say, I will um, put up the um, the code that uh, for that graph creation. I'll put my copy of the code up there um, on Git for you, and there is within that as well. Um, just to show you quickly, actually. Um, Sorry, my client's just one. So the it's weight, the edges weight. So in the first script, um, it's the weight in the edges um, data frame, which is is, is causing that, that difference um, in in the plot. So so in the edges data frame, where does the how is the weight calculated in there? I don't quite understand that. How is it calculated? In, in yes, in the edges data frame, in the first script that we did, the data transformation yeah. script. In, in so that one. Th that's to do with the number of patients. So it's the count that you get when creating the adjacency matrix. The more because people there are going through. That's it. Yes. Yeah. The number of people that are moving from the, a source service as a source node to a target node because okay. if you remember we're going through yes the data looking at each client and yeah. their movement and counting and adding one to each source target yeah. um, relation that okay. uh, each time and that count becomes our weight okay okay yeah, that's great. Okay, thank you. Um, just to say, so in the copy of um, the code, the uh, graph creation code uh, that I'll put up on Git, there are um, other layouts in there as well that you can test and try. Um, so, for example, here I'll just run the graph using the spring layout. So you can see that these are different um, different layout algorithms which are based on random seeds and so they do change each time. We will look much more in depth at this in the advanced sessions because it is an incredibly 
deep and uh, difficult topic, um, creating decent graph layouts is, is not an easy, easy thing at all. Um, and a lot of them require, uh, you, you get to the point where you have to create custom layouts for every data set that you have, um, which, are, which are not the simplest thing. Um, let's see, example of ooh, spectral layout. There's a very old layout there. Um, and the other one is to have a look at some of the, if you are interested in uh, network analysis, is to have a look at some of the uh, NetworkX documentation. So there are a whole range of tutorials on here. The documentation is really quite good for NetworkX. Um, talks all about adding attributes, directed graphs, multi-graphs. It all gets quite, quite in depth. Um, there are galleries to show you different um, examples of different types of graph that you can get. Um, there are some, uh, let's just see if there's um, good examples here. Um, yeah, there's the code for um, lots of different examples, all the reference uh, material, the different algorithms that you get will go much more into this next time actually looking at all the well, a variety, a large variety of the different uh, graph metrics that we, need, we can use to understand system function and structure and really putting that into into context for you so i say please do join if you'd like and uh yeah i hope to hope to see you for the advanced sessions um if anybody's got any more questions i'm happy to hang around for a bit i know we're a little bit early um finishing so um bit of an extended lunch break <laughs> would, it be, would it be too much of a big ask for you just to show us geffy in the next five minutes if you've got something set up already um i have nothing set up i'm afraid richard i will um, I, ret I retract my question <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I will be demonstrating geffy in in the next sessions and again they'll all be recorded so um if uh, even if you don't attend those sessions you'll be able to uh look at the um the recordings on the youtube channel uh, Ellen, have you got your hand up there? Yes, yes. Um, how is this problem before you leave? Sorry, Ellen, you're going to have to speak up. I can't hear you. Okay, can you hear me now? No, I'm sorry, Ellen, I can't, I can't hear you at all. You have to turn your microphone up. Is it fine now? No? Uh, okay, I can just about hear you. Yep. Okay, sorry. I always have problem to find the afternoon link for the uh, for the afternoon class. Sorry, say that again. Um, the link for the afternoon class. Oh, the link for the afternoon session. Um, right. Yes. So that um, is in the calendar invite um, that you'll have received the Outlook calendar invite, and that's the second link in there, that's for Dan's session this afternoon. And Dan, I think we'll also post it in Slack. Um, Sorry, Sean, I, I missed the question. Thank you a lot. Was that regarding this afternoon? It was the link, yeah, the Zoom link for this afternoon. So yeah, I'll, 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 I'll post that in a second uh, onto, yeah. onto Slack. It'll be my normal um, the, the session, the normal link for my sessions, but I'll repost that um, on, on Slack. Um, I'm just saying, so we'll, st we'll start at 1.30 as normal, so you have a bit of an extended lunch. Um, 